up, we're going to go ahead and sing a couple of songs and worship the Lord. So if you will, stand with me as we uh, ask the Lord to bless this time together. Hallelujah. Father, here we are again, so thankful for this opportunity on another Wednesday night to come together in fellowship, to come together to worship you, Lord, to come together to hear your word spoke spoken into our lives we love you and thank you so much and just ask your presence to be here as we worship in jesus name amen let's worship the lord amen well if you're happy to be here let's open up the service with just a hand clap of praise to god and thanks that we can gather again in his name and worship tonight give him a hand clap of praise to the lord come on sing with us Lift your voice tonight just as we sing a couple of songs to open up the service.
that tonight, church.
in all things, great and small, Lord, and know that our help, our joy, our peace that the world cannot take comes from you and you alone, and you alone are worthy of all the glory, the honor, and the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, church, say amen tonight and clap your hands one more time and give them praise as you are being seated. Hallelujah. going to come up and continue our guests sharing out of Genesis. So uh, thank you, praise team. Very good. Spirit of the Lord is here. Now pray, pray God opens our hearts, our minds, our ears. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Brother James. Good to see all of you tonight. Thanks for being here. We're in Genesis chapter 7, beginning with verse 6. And this is going to be, of course, the flood. And Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. That's repeated in verse 11 in the 600th year of Noah's life. So he's 600 years old. Back in Genesis 6, when God tells Noah, I'm going to shorten man's years to 120 years, I've, I've heard preacher after preacher over the decades say that Noah, that means Noah worked on the ark for 120 years. Uh, for 120 years he was building the ark, but no. God spoke to him to build the ark in the 500th year of his life. And the flood comes in the 600th year of his life. That's, that's 100 years, not 120. So what was the 120 years God was referring to back in Genesis 6? Well, it wasn't Noah's lifetime, or nor was he saying you've got 120 years before the flood comes. God was talking about reducing these lengthy periods of men's lives you know, 900 years, 800 years, and so forth, that people were living. God says, after this flood, I'm going to start reducing men's lives, and we will begin to see that. Their lives get shorter. 700 years, 600, 500, 400, 300. Finally, we get down to Abraham, who lives 175 years, I think, and then we get down to Moses, who lives 120 and after Moses, we scarcely see anyone live up to 120 afterwards. Uh, I think only the high priest Jehoiada beat that in all the Old Testament. So Noah is now 600 years old. Back to Genesis 7, verse 6. This would be calculating from the creation of Adam. This would be the year 1,600 and 56, since the creation of Adam, 1656. Verse 7 says, And Noah went in, and his sons, and his wife, and his sons' wives with him, into the ark, because of the waters of the flood. Peter famously will tell us in the New Testament, only eight people survived the flood. Noah, Mrs. Noah, his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their three wives, Mrs. Shem, Mrs. Ham, and Mrs. Japheth. Eight people surviving the flood. Okay, verse 8, of clean beasts, and of beasts that are not clean, and of fowls, and of everything that creepeth upon the earth. Now, we also read in the previous chapter that of Animals that were known as clean animals, those that could be eaten by man, although that law has not been specified yet, nor will it begin to be specified until Exodus and Leviticus. But uh, already God is talking about what animals are considered clean and unclean. Of the unclean animals, there was one male and one female. Of the clean animals, there were seven. 
maybe four males and three females, or one male and six females. We, we're not told exactly. But uh, they went into the ark. Here's a question. What did Noah eat during his sojourn on the ark? What did his family eat? What do you think? Have you ever considered it? Did they order takeout? What, what was available to them? Well, obviously, he was breeding the clean animals on the ark and eating of them and probably had a lot of planters to grow grain in. We're, we're going to come to a little passage that sounds like God tells Noah, feed the well, send the birds out so that they can re, uh, uh, re-green the earth. Well, what do birds have to do with it? Well, you feed birds a lot of grain and they fly around and in their droppings are partially digested and ready to start growing pellets of fertilizer from their bodies containing these seeds that they drop on the earth. Without birds, we would not have grass and shrubbery growing. Birds eat seeds and drop those seeds ready to start growing all over the earth. So birds are going to be very important. And I think that in the ark, Noah, who we will find out from the numerology here, he was actually in the ark one year and 10 days, 375 days in all. So that's enough time to grow a lot of things uh, if you've got planters in the ark with you, which I suppose is that's, that's what's suggested to us. Uh, verse 9, there went in two and two unto Noah in the ark, the male and the female, as God had commanded Noah. What I want you to notice is the way this language plays out. The writer repeats himself a lot. I've already shown you that twice he tells us in the 600th year of Noah's life. And he'll repeat this two and two business and a lot of other things will be repeated. Well, what does that tell us, this repetitious language? Well, it tells us that Genesis, at least this part of Genesis, was probably written by the same cat who wrote Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers repetitive thing. Something said in one verse will be repeated almost word for word two verses later. This is Moses' writing style to repeat a lot, to make sure the idea is precisely gotten across to the reader. And that's one of the big indicators that scholars of, of, uh, of uh, source criticism uh, insist that Whoever wrote Exodus is the same guy who wrote Genesis because the style is the same and you don't find that repetitious writing style very often elsewhere in the Bible. All right, verse 10, And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. So they go into the ark uh, and uh, if there's a door, We will read later, God, in verse 16, the Lord shuts Noah in. People have preached a lot of sermons about God closing the door on the ark. Uh, I I don't know if it really means that he closed the door. If I were Noah, I would pull the door shut myself. I think uh, when it says God shut him in, it means that by God's order, he didn't come out of the ark. However you want to take that. We have verse 11, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, look how precise that is calendar-wise. Telling us exactly what day the flood came. And how did the flood come? The next clause, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. So these floodwaters are coming from two sources. Let me just propose about this for a minute. There's water coming up out of the earth, underground water 
bursting up through the surface of the earth. Also, something has happened, making water fall out of the sky. Now, we're told earlier in Genesis that it didn't rain in the Garden of Eden. There was no rain, but rather a mist came up from the ground, a foggy mist that watered all the plants of the earth, but not actually a rain cycle with waters evaporating and going up into the higher atmosphere, condensing and cooling and then precipitating in droplets back down. That, if that happened at all, it didn't happen as a general thing yet. But also, why did these people live to be hundreds of years? Well, here's speculative notions about that. Sun's rays are good for us. They produce chlorophyll. You know, they give us vitamin D and something else being out in the sun. But the rays of the sun are also dangerous to us. Ultraviolet light rays in the sun, infrared rays in the sun. Sometimes, uh, you know, uh, I forget from the comic books what kind of light rays uh, turn the guy into the Incredible Hulk. But, uh, yeah, gamma rays. Thank you, comic book reader. Yeah, I need an expert uh, to help me from time to time. And, uh, well, there are gamma rays in the sun, and some of those things are harmful to us and even carcinogenic. Uh, perhaps the rays of the sun have something to do with limiting our lifespan. Now, prior to the flood, what about this theory? There was an ice canopy around the earth, not just around it in one angle, but a complete sphere of ice particles way up above the ionosphere. Water, frozen water in crystallized foggy form circling the earth and enveloping the earth. Something happened to crash all of that down into the lower atmosphere where it would melt into water. And whatever it was that crashed down that outer ice canopy also flew into the surface of the earth, pierced and punctured the earth's crust so that waters within the earth surged upward. Now, there are some islands on the earth, most notably the, the nation of Iceland, which uh, we now know, and Hawaii, and Krakatoa, and parts of Fiji, that uh, Iceland, for instance, is very interesting. It's all uh, a blister on the earth, as though a meteor, and we're pretty sure that's what happened, sometime in the past, flew down into the North Atlantic Ocean, pierced the Earth's or punctured the Earth's crust, magma flowed up and formed the island that we now call the nation of Iceland. Uh, could it be, since the Bible, we just read it, says the self-same day, the same day where the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened, a day, 24-hour period. What happens in 24 hours? Well, the earth makes a full circle around. What if a meteor shower was sent by God that came down and began to drag down the earth's uh, ice canopy in the upper atmosphere, and as the earth turned, the meteor shower lasted 24 hours, and kept dragging that canopy down until it had drugged down the ice canopy from all around the earth. Meantime, some of those meteors were puncturing, or, or puncturing the earth's surface. So water is coming up and water is coming down. That's maybe far-fetched, but it sounds to me like the most plausible response to what we read in that scripture of the Bible. Anybody else have any ideas you'd like to inject on this? Well, if not, I'll let what I have said stand as indisputable science. 
All right. Then, did you start to say something? Where is this? So this is past the mantle of the earth. Yeah. Down below the hot magma? Is this boiling water? Is it? Mm -hmm. But it's there. Well, Yeah. No, well, I'm just looking at that one verse that says both, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it came down and it surged up. But, yeah, that's very interesting. We've always known that there are underground rivers and underground lakes. Uh, we tap into them from time to time. Uh, it's a big mystery. Solomon talked about it. All the rivers flow into the sea, and yet the sea is never filled. And yet the waters continue flowing down from the tops of mountains. Now, how does that happen? Only by rain coming up and carried by clouds to drop down on the mountains? That doesn't account for keeping Mississippis and Niles and, you know, and Amazon rivers flowing downhill. Uh, there's just not enough rain. Uh, somehow there's a percolation that takes place. This has often been reckoned that something percolates up out of the earth into the high places to continue to flow. Uh, there's, there's a lot of geo-hydro science about it. Uh, what pressures in the earth force water up to high places to keep them flowing down creeks and rivers. But we know there's water there. Water itself is about the same weight as iron. Water is heavy. A bucket of water and a bucket of iron are are, are, are comparable in weight. So if most of the Earth's core is iron, I think it could also be H2O down in there somewhere waiting to come up. But, well, we're not geophysicists or scientists, and I certainly don't pretend to be, but I'm just discussing the way the Bible has it for us. Water came up, water came down, and it covered the Earth. In the uh, verse uh, 12, and the rain was upon the earth 40 nights and 40 days. Now the word the rain, that uh, it should be taken in a verbal form. It rained. It continued falling on the earth or spouting up from the earth. Imagine these terrific geysers all around the earth. Now, at the time, uh, we're not going to get to this until we hit chapter 10 of Genesis, but it is pretty much thought by most geophysicists that there was only one continent on the surface of the earth prior to the flood. It's known as Pangea by people who write about it. Uh, that's Greco-linguistics. Pan means omni or everywhere, and Jaya means earth. So all earth, Pangea was joined together. If I had a map, I could show you where, uh, you know, South, South America has that shape that once fit up into the armpit of Africa. And uh, New England uh, was once joined to what we now call Great Britain, which was pushed up against France. All of it was, was one gigantic landmass on one side of the planet. It wasn't until after the flood that we began to see the earth cracking up, uh, you know, the plate tectonics sliding up. We do know that the Atlantic Ocean is getting a little wider by a few feet every year. The Pacific Ocean is also getting 
a little wider every year, and these land masses that we call continents are sliding across the face of the earth. There is a kind of percolation going on down under the oceans uh, where these, these, these great massive plates uh, are rising up and, and the pieces of land are moving apart. And we're going to see in a minute that the floodwaters fell and covered the highest mountains as much as 22 feet of water above the highest peak, 15 cubits. Well, that, I, I, I doubt if that's possible if the Himalayas were extant at the time, uh, Mount Everest and some of the higher mountains. But before the flood, we probably didn't have mountains that high on this planet. We know that the Himalayas were probably made because India, what we now call India used to be connected to Madagascar, which itself was part of southern Africa. And after the flood, what we now call India slid away, pulled some of Madagascar with it, left Madagascar behind. And what we call India, and, and the tracks of this are still there on the seabed. What we call India, the subcontinent, moved up across what we nowadays call the Indian Ocean, sort of slammed in to the southern coast of Asia, and as it slammed in, it thrust up these mountains that we now call the Himalayas. It's like two automobiles that crash head on at a full speed, and they force one another up. Uh, there are different kinds of mountains on the earth, some are formed by blistering under the earth where a mountain just rises. Others are formed by volcanic activity. Some are formed by heating and cooling elements. But some of the mountains on earth, and we see this in the, in the, uh, uh, the Peruvian mountains also in South America, the Andes, some are formed by actual crashing and rising up. And this was a theory until we got cameras in satellites going around the Earth that can take pictures of these things and prove them. Uh, there probably wasn't any mountain that high on Earth at the time of Noah's flood. So here's what we've got. The rain was upon the Earth 40 days and 40 nights. That's how long the water was surging up and falling down. In the self-same day entered Noah, Shem, and Ham, and Japheth, the sons of Noah, Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with them into the ark. Uh, they and every beast after his kind, and all cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and every fowl after his kind, every bird of every sort, and they went in unto the ark, or in unto Noah into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. And they that went in, went in, male and female of all flesh, as the Lord had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. Uh, notice again the repetitious speech in this, in this narrative. And the flood was forty days upon the earth, and the waters increased and bare up the ark, and it was lift up above, above the earth. Now, this ark has no rudder, no sail, no propeller mechanism, no oars, no motor. It is simply a large floating box, and there's no way to steer it or navigate with it. It is simply, the word ark will be used later in the Bible two more times. It simply means a receptacle. Uh, Moses' mother in Genesis will make a little ark to put her baby in and she'll seal it up good and tie the lid on and set it afloat in the swamps of the Nile. Then later, uh, God will command Moses to build an ark, a receptacle for the presence of God's mercy among men, the famous ark of the covenant. Now, the word ark simply means container. 
But in all three times, it is a container of something that is holy or sacrosanct. All natural life is kept in Noah's ark. This is, this is holy and precious. Uh, in the ark of Moses, the life of God's chosen prophet is kept in it as a baby. And in the ark of the covenant, God's own presence on earth is kept. The word ark simply means receptacle. Imagine Noah now. This ark, the uh, waters finally get high enough and uh, that the ark itself that he has built begins to be lifted up and floating. And now he's, all that's in the ark is at the whim of the currents, the waves, and perhaps winds. And they don't know where they're going or where they will set down. They're simply alive in it. And verse 18, the waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark went upon the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth. That's another repetition. And all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered 15 cubits. Now a cubit is about a foot and a half, 18 inches. So 15 cubits, that's uh, roughly 22, 23 feet. Uh, Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. Now, 22 feet doesn't sound real deep, does it? Go out in the lake and dive down 22 feet and see how much water pressure there is. It'll burst your ears. Your ears will pop and bleed, and you'll go deaf diving at that depth if you're not skilled in it how to, the right way to hold your breath and your pressure. Uh, so uh, that, that's, that's a huge amount of weight and water pressure. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl, cattle, beast, and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, and every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life, of all that was in the dry land, died. I'll come back to that in a minute. I have something I want to say about it. Did God kill in anger? We don't really see his anger stated, just his regret. It repented God that he had made man on the earth. And man had corrupted God's ways in all the earth. The wickedness of man was great upon the earth. And then man had produced, and God says this twice back in chapter 6, uh, man had produced violence, warfare that filled all the earth. Now just bear that in mind. Men are killing one another in wholesale slaughter every day, slashing and gouging and piercing and shooting and clubbing and People are suffering. People are dying anyway. God says drowning them all out is actually a more merciful way to die than the way they are dying at one another's hands. I want you to try to think of the flood as actually an act of, it's an ironic thing to say, actually uh, perhaps a deed of mercy upon man rather than let man do what men were doing to one another anyway. God says, I want to preserve the, 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 the human race in this receptacle of life that Noah has built, the ark. But all of the others, uh, I'm just going to dispense with them in the easiest way possible, and perhaps in the most merciful way possible. And verse 23, every living substance was destroyed which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and the creeping things and the fowl of the heavens, and they were destroyed from the earth. And Noah only remained alive, and they who were with him in the ark and the waters prevailed upon the earth 
150 days. This is after the 40 days of rain. So we're told earlier Noah and his family went into the ark seven days before it started raining, closed the door on the ark, either God or Noah did, at the end of the seventh day. Then the rains came for 40 days, so that's 47 days, and now 150 days of floating around. So that's 197 days right there, a little over six months. So we come to chapter 8. Please, anybody, interrupt me at any moment if you have a comment. I'd love to hear them. Otherwise, I'm going to chatter on. And God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters assuaged. The fountains also of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped. And the rain from heaven was restrained, and the waters returned from off the earth continually. They're draining somewhere, draining off the earth. We, we still look at the formations of canyons. Look at the Grand Canyon of the Colorado River out in the western part of our continent. That huge cavern was cut by water drain. The Great Lakes were formed by water drainage. Glaciers in some place, which are water, frozen, they still move. They creep slowly an inch or two a year. But they also scour the earth with great chasms. Flowing water like we've just read about. Surely it would cut valleys, gorges, lake beds, river beds. It would have changed the topography of the entire Pangea of the Earth's land surface. And now rivers are being cut as the water finds its heavy way to go following gravity. And they returned off the Earth continually after the end of the, 40, of, of the 150 days, the waters were abated. And the ark, in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, found itself wedged on top of a mountain somewhere that Noah will later call Ararat. Mount Ararat is still there to this day. It is in eastern Turkey, not far from the Armenian border. And uh, you can go visit it if you want to climb it. It's one of the highest mountains in the world. Not the highest, but it's among the highest. And uh, I talked about it last time I spoke on a Wednesday night, how it seems that there's this huge arc up there frozen in a glacier that partly sticks out from time to time when it's warm enough. Uh, it's in two pieces. Looks like the Titanic broken in two as it sank. Uh, but it's there. On this, on top of this mountain in a crater that has a frozen lake in it, and who would have drug all that timber up there to build a boat as big as, a, as an aircraft carrier, bigger, uh, and build it and launch it into a lake that's not even big enough for it to turn around in? But there it sits. Uh, so the ark rested there. Verse 5, the waters decreased continually until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, Noah looks out and sees the tops of mountains around in the distance peeking up out of the water. They looked like little island keys, but the water was going down, and soon they were revealed to be mountains that had been freshly cut and whittled by all this water movement. And a whole new topography of the earth is going to be revealed with hills, mountains, and valleys after the flood. Now here's this beautiful story that I wanted to get to. Oh my goodness, am I reading the clock right? Seems like I only started and I'm already out of time. Let me at least get through this lovely parabolic story. And it, I'll just read the whole thing and then come back and discuss it. It came to pass at the end of 40 days 
so. It rained for 40 days, then they floated for a month, then they lodged and jammed up in the rocks on top of Mount Ararat, they came to ground there, and Noah still has to sit for another 40 days inside the ark, waiting. He doesn't want to get out of the ark yet. He might sink up to his neck in mud. He wants it to dry out so he can get out on his hands and knees and kiss the ground, you know, terra firma at last. So he has to wait for 40 days for the earth to dry out. Okay, Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. And he sent forth a raven, which went forth to and fro until the waters were dried up from off the earth. Also Noah sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground. But the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot. And she returned unto him into the ark, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. And he put forth his hand from the window, and she, she rested on his wrist, and he took her in and pulled her in unto him into the ark. He stayed yet another seven days, and again he sent forth the dove out of the ark, and the dove came into him in the evening. But a little something different this time. Lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So Noah knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. And he waited yet another seven days and sent forth the dove the third time, which returned not again unto him anymore. Now, we could have done without that story and understood everything. We could have skipped over that raven flying and dove flying and uh, you know, there are a lot of details the writer could have given to us, you know, things that happened during that year and ten days in the ark, things that Mrs. Noah said to Mr. Noah, you know, and things the boys said and discussions and worries. We could have been told about a whole lot of stuff, how they occupied their time. Uh, the, the questions I have, you know, uh, like what did they eat and how did they cook it and all of this, uh, we could have been told more details, but no! We're just told the same things, sometimes three or four times the same way. Uh, I sure would have liked it if he had just said each thing one time and then added some more details about what was going on, but we don't get that. But we do get this. The story of Noah flying a raven off of his hand out of the ark and then three times flying a dove out. Why is this detail important enough to be in the story? Are you following what I'm questioning here? Why this? Well, it becomes terrifically symbolic, I think, later in the Bible. A dove is a clean bird. You can cook it and eat it. A raven is an unclean bird. Why? What makes a raven uh, among the list of unclean birds in Noah's law. Any of you know? A raven is a cannibal. Not only because a raven will eat a raven, it will also eat rotten, carn and decayed, de pardon me, decayed flesh. A raven is a meat eater. God would later tell Noah, or Moses, you don't eat any animal that eats other animals, except certain fish. But they have to be scaled fish, not bottom feeders like catfish or mollusks. But as for animals and birds on land, you don't eat carnivores, and you certainly don't eat. Uh, what do you? All I can think of is the Spanish word limpia campos. Oh. Uh, that means land cleaners. Uh, our English word is scavenger animals, things that go and eat dirty, dying, dead, roadkill, and so forth. You don't eat them. Well, that's what a raven is. Uh, doves, however, are herbivores. They don't, and, and it's insectivores, but they don't eat, uh, they don't eat filth like ravens do. 
Now, a raven is black in color. Doves are usually kind of ash gray or white. Now, the word here from the Hebrew is turtur, which means it's a turtle dove, probably white. And they call them turtle doves, not because they're related to the shell or turtle that swims around, but because of their sound. It's an onomatopoeia, a, uh, uh, w- which is a, a word we speak that imitates a sound, like bam or bang or uh, whish, you know, or all these words we have that kind of imitate other sounds that we try to duplicate them in our speech. Tur, tur is the sound the dove makes. Tur, tur, we call it cooing. Uh, but these tur, tur doves mate for life. If their mate dies, either the male or the female will never mate again. They, they're symbolic for their lifelong faithfulness and love for their spouse. And the sound tur tur is uh, very popular uh, in Hebrew poetry when we read that the the voice of the turtle is heard in the land. That means the cooing, the tur tur of the dove when Israel becomes Beulah land and uh, the the, the land of faithfully married to God uh, as in the writings of the prophets. Uh, the voice of the tour tour is heard in the land. Well, that's what this dove is that Noah sends out from the ark. There would have been seven such tour tour doves in the ark since he took seven of every clean fowl. So he takes this one, referred to in the feminine here, she and her, and he releases her. Now, he's already released the raven, and we're told that the raven flew hither, thither, and yon, but never came back. What happened to the raven? Did he drown? No, because the raven could find rotting corpses rising and floating on the water and be happy to sit upon them and feed upon them. The raven could find whale's bodies, you know, and other things coming up out of the water He could find something that satisfied him, but a dove is not going to land on anything like that. She flew as far and wide as she could, and the sun is setting, and she returns. Noah's been watching, watching, watching. He doesn't see the raven come back, but in the distance he sees that dove's wings fluttering, and he puts his hand out, and she flies right to his hand, and he takes her in. Seven days later, he tries it again with her, Same thing, except when she comes back this time, she still found no place she could actually build a nest in. But she did find something sticking up out of the water that was not dead and rotting. It was greenery, something growing down below the surface. Of course, there are no leaves on it. But just above the surface, the peak of an olive tree is sticking out and is making its chlorophyll and there's greenery there. Now, why an olive? Why is this important symbolically? What's the olive tree all about? Anybody? Well, it symbolizes peace, yeah, but the reason it symbolizes peace is because of this passage. What else is important about an olive, Stephen? Oily. Down in its branches and roots, the olive tree survived a year underwater because it was full of oil in it. It's an oily tree, an oily wood, and all the water did not permeate and rot it. And so now it's sticking up. The the dove can just barely wrap her claws around one of the little twigs enough to pick off a little a little uh, leaf, oily leaf from this olive tree, and fly back. When she sits on Noah's wrist, he takes this out of her beak. Why, it's an olive leaf. Seven days later, he lets her fly out again, and she finds her final resting place and does not return. Now, what does this story 
mean to you? What do you get from it? A raven that goes out and is happy to feed on dead things and never comes back? An evil bird. And then the lovely bird flies out once, flies out the second time, comes back with a promise, flies out the third time and does not return. What does that symbolize to you? Let me give you a hint. When God tells John the Baptist the Holy Spirit is going to come upon the Messiah, you will see it visionarily in the form of a dove coming down and resting upon his head. Why again a dove? What does it mean? Somebody talk to me. Pastor, don't give me that I have no idea look. You've got to have an idea. What is thought? Brother Terry, you're scowling hard at me today. <laughs> All right. Well, three visitations if the dove represents the Holy Spirit sent to the earth. Actually, the first mention of a dove in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 1. And it's only kind of clandestinely mentioned as a dove, but when it says, and the earth was without form and void, and the Spirit of God moved upon the surface of the deep. Not really the best translation. It actually, the word is actually brooded like a hen upon a, a dove hen, upon the egg of creation until, as what happens in the slimes within an egg, when, it's, when a mother bird broods upon it, sits upon her eggs, the stuff inside turns until it begins to coalesce and solidify and come into order and within a few weeks actually produces a fluffy baby chick. <laughs> now ain't that something? Turning a bunch of yellow slime into a baby chick, that's quite a trick. But that's what a mother bird does with all that's within the egg. And uh, the word referred to there, the Spirit of the Lord moved, means brooded as a mother dove upon the creation. The, the dove represents symbolically the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. And there have been three visitations of the Holy Spirit upon earth. Is this interesting to anyone? I mean, I'm getting those stares again tonight. I really wish I had a bunch of happy people uh, it just seemed delighted to have me get up and talk to them instead of starers like this crowd here tonight. Three visitations of the Holy Spirit upon mankind, upon the world. The first was in the administration of Adam. The Spirit of God came upon the earth but eventually flew around all over humanity found no place to rest her foot, and flew back up again. Then, in the administration of Moses, the Spirit of God comes down, and there Moses has gathered what will become Israel. But they don't really water. The Holy Spirit can't remain upon them, but does bring back to heaven a promise, the olive branch of the covenant, brings it back to God saying, so to speak, there will be a final resting place for my spirit. I found the olive tree, that was Israel. And the third visitation of the Holy Spirit is in the administration of Jesus Christ, which came to earth in him. And then, just a few days after he ascended into heaven, the Holy Spirit had remained on earth to now fill his believers. He found his final resting place. Now, as I'm closing, just think of this terminology. Final resting place. God's Spirit has looked for a resting place among mankind. He's come, he's had to fly off, he's come and sniffed around a bit and had to fly off again, but finally, he comes into his people redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ 
and finds his final resting place. Throughout the Bible, we see God arriving in the form of his spirit uh, to get into different things. He was, he was on Mount Sinai once, but he's not there now. He was in, uh, he was in the jawbone of an ass that Samson swung, but he didn't stay in it. He was in Moses' rod once, but he didn't stay in it. He was in Gideon's torch once, but he didn't stay there. We see God get into a lot of things, but not remain in them. But there's one place that God came into by his spirit and said, this is my resting place. I will not leave this habitation. I will not leave this place. And he looks around at what he's in. He's inside of his believers now. And he says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I'll remain with you always, even to the ends of the earth. He's finally found the place he makes his nest, and that is in our hearts. God bless you. Thank you for your attention tonight. Let's go ahead and stand to our feet. Just a quick uh, announcement for, uh, we have our church anniversary coming up and then our next whole congregational invite for breakfast will be to join us on the April the 5th and then it'll be three weeks after that. We'll do it again, but May, May 5th, yeah. Thank you for that. That happens to me all the time. <laughs> I, I, my other half is my organizer, so thank you. So uh, if you can join us on, the, on that on the 5th, that would be terrific. Just a little bit of fellowship before we actually come in here to worship the Lord. Father, we love you. Thank you for your word tonight. Thank you for speaking to us. And Holy Spirit of God, thank you that you found your resting place in us. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. God bless you. Have a beautiful rest of your Wednesday evening. <laughs>